be talking about uh, street life's beliefs, and uh, I used this wonderful analogy last week, and I got a little funny addition to it. But I mean, when you think about it, we all have primary aspects of being a human being, and I mean, it is true that all these things make up human beings, like skeletal systems, respiratory systems, muscular systems, circulatory systems, digestive systems, and nervous systems, although that slide is cut off, right? And I mean, those make up humans, but actually my friend Chris Van Horn reminded me that they also make up horses. Um, so we also have consciences. We have a conscience that makes us human. All these systems, and I mean, the fact that we have a conscience, we have a soul, like we have the ability to be moral agents on this earth is how they used to say it in seminary because they wanted to sound all smart, right? Like that makes us human, right? And those are primary aspects of being a human being. Like these things that make up human beings are primary things. And I mean, we, have, we all got them in common, man. It don't matter like what our politics are. It don't matter what our theological background is. It don't matter what our culture is. It don't matter the color of our skin. It don't matter like what socioeconomic place we're in. It doesn't matter our upbringing. It doesn't matter our personality. We all got this stuff in common and we all got conscience, right? And we all have that in common. We all have a soul. And I mean like that stuff makes us human. Those are primary things, but also there are secondary things that are unique about our humanity, aren't there? Come on, we praise God for that stuff, don't we? Y'all awake in here, man? I'm just making sure that you're awake and alive. Things like skin color, eye color, hair color, hair type, body shape, height, and weight. These are unique aspects of what it means to be a human being, all right? However, those could be called secondary aspects of being a human. I mean, those are secondary things. I mean, we all have the primary skeletal, muscular, digestive, soul part of us, right? But then we got all these unique features and attributes personalities and dispositions, all these sorts of things, right? And I mean, we so easily divide over secondary aspects of being human, don't we? Don't we? That's what we do, man. We got an issue with that as human beings. But I mean, like, we really all got skeletal, respiratory, muscular, circulatory, digestive, nervous systems like horses, and we got souls. We've got conscience, right? So, I mean, with all that to say, I'm continuing to endeavor into a very difficult subject over the next six weeks. Originally, I planned to do three weeks of this series, but I realized as I was praying about it and as I was just feeling like absolutely halted and like confused and concerned, like and realizing how heavy these things are, like I realized we needed to stretch it out to six weeks. We needed to double the time. I realized that like I'm on the preaching calendar for six weeks straight, which usually like I give away one a month. But for this like foreseeable future, I'm going to be able to do this. And I really want to dig into these beliefs. I want to dig into Streetlight's beliefs. I want to dig into our core beliefs. And then at the end of it, in the last few weeks, I want to talk about what makes us unique as a community and some of the secondary convictions we got as a community that make us unique as well. And it's a tall order, so pray for me, okay? But I mean, that's what we're going to be talking about. We're in week two. We're simply calling this Streetlight beliefs because it's core stuff. And we used this uh, analogy last week. Right? And I mean, we talked about the fact that everybody has preferences, right? Everybody has convictions. And everybody has beliefs. And those beliefs are very core things. Like, things as Christ followers, we can really genuinely hold in common and unite on it. We can love one another on We can love each other on those beliefs. Those are things that can bring people together in love. I mean, they're the things that are keeping the church together in places like underground China Christianity, where like, People are being held together by these core beliefs, and they might even have different convictions on secondary things, but there's still unity, right? Because that next layer is convictions, and convictions and beliefs can be easily confused, because I mean, like, convictions are things that can be very biblical, that we're very, very tethered to, that we hold on to very, very tightly, right? But, like, they can inform our beliefs so much that they can divide us, right? And then, of course, preferences can also, they can divide us. Like, preferences are things like, do we like the style? Do we like that they did reggae there? Like, did somebody maybe today went, oh, reggae, man, I hate reggae. I'm going to leave this church. You know, like, people think about that kind of stuff in our culture. They do. Like, do you like hip-hop or not? Do you like the way we do communion or not? Do you like the style of preaching? Do you like, like, the style of music? Do you like the style of, like, the church here? Do you like the fact that we meet outside in the summer? Do you like the fact that we're, like, in Kenmore? Lots of people, like, they're freaked out by our church just because of that. Thank you for being here, man. 
The God loves Kenmore. Amen? Y'all still awake out there? Good. Listen, again, it has to be said. These things can divide us. Preferences can, and convictions can divide us. And sometimes even beliefs divide us. They do. Like, because I mean, as followers of Jesus and human beings, we often think we can like reinvent things and then they end up being worse than the original. Can I give you an analogy? Uh, we had to get a new can opener recently. <laughs> you know, Sarah knows this story. All right, can opener. A can opener is a can opener, man. Like, yeah. <laughs> There's one kind of can opener. Like, it's the kind that you put on a can, and you twist it, and you get the thing off. And you can have an electric one on the wall, and those work well, too. Like, the ones that actually work, they got to be able to work. We found this can opener online that's a battery-powered one, and you put it on the top of the can, and then it goes like, and, like, spins around. You know what I'm talking about? And then it doesn't open the can. And then you got to do it again. And again, and again, and then finally you get it, and then you want to throw the thing like at the wall by the end, and then you just go spend $5 and get a cheap can opener, right? Like, I really think that, you know, it's a bad invention. Like, we, it didn't improve on the original, is what I'm saying. And I'll say, there are liberal and conservative distortions of Christianity that don't improve on the original. They don't. Like, there are all sorts of, like, distortions. Like, it's like that bad can opener. It doesn't work, right? And, I mean, those are out there. And, I mean, the teaching of Jesus, come on, give him praise. The New Testament letters, the testimony of the most faithful movements of the church throughout history, they really do destroy and diminish the, like, they, they don't destroy and diminish the power of the gospel. They don't, like, lessen. They don't make it, like, lose its power. They're the ones that hold it together. Amen? It's like an original can opener. It works. It's stuff that works. Maybe it's even a poor analogy because, I mean, it works so well. Like, it works in heaven and on earth. So, I mean, to bring further clarity, let me continue to just share what the primary convictions of Street Light Community Church, as revealed in our Articles of Faith, are. We did it the first two last week, and we're going to do the third and fourth this week, all right? And can I remind you, doctrine, that's what we're talking about. Doctrine is beautiful, y'all. <laughs> You want to know why? Because it's meant to lead us to worship. Like truth about God transforms our minds and our hearts and our souls, and it leads us to a place of intimacy with God. That's why these truths are so powerful, because they lead to that intimacy. They really do. And they unite people in love like nothing else. They do. And I mean, we're going to dig into them now. Let's do it. You ready? Say, I'm ready. 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 Okay, we're going to dig into Streetlight's third article of faith. And it's this one. It says, we believe that Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God, conceived of the Holy Spirit, and born of the Virgin Mary. Ooh, let's unpack that. All right. Right? He is fully God and fully man without division or confusion of the two natures. All right, listen. Let me level with you. I was raised agnostic. And if at the age of 17 somebody told me I would one day fully embrace and believe in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, I would have told them they're a wacko, and I probably would have tried to corrupt them and make them forget what they just told me. Okay? Because that, that's where I was at before. I was like, are you crazy? <laughs> like, a virgin got pregnant and had the Messiah? A virgin got pregnant and had the Son of God? Really? I'm like, yeah, right. You want to know why I had those beliefs, though? Because, like, I grew up agnostic. I didn't, like, read the Bible or anything like that, right? I had never studied it for myself or, like, looked at evidence or looked at history or, like, looked at scripture or anything like that. I mean, a lot of the reason why I thought it was weird is because of Zeus, Somebody say Zeus. <laughs> Somebody say Zeus. <laughs> One more time. Just rolls off the tongue. Did you know that the Greeks worshipped gods like Zeus who had relations with human women and men? And yet in the same breath, Plato's dialogues also said, for do not men regard Zeus as the best and most righteous of the gods. All right? Wow, y'all. Like, that's hard for me to imagine thinking that a criminal god was great. Okay? That he literally violated people sexually, okay? That's what they believe. Now, I had studied this stuff, and I'm like, is that connected somehow? Do Christians believe that? Like, and I'll get to that. But, I mean, it's like, I imagine, dude, like, there was an episode of Law and Order SVU. I don't know if you saw it, but they, they actually came after the god Zeus, and they arrested him. That's not true. <laughs> so, I mean, the real thing about Zeus is that he was wild, okay? Like, he was a crazy god 
that was promiscuous. And he did impregnate human beings and goddesses and gods. He did that. Like, so, and it created demigods. So I used to think of that kind of stuff, and I know you're going to think I'm crazy, but you could understand why am I pre-believing in Jesus and being filled with the Holy Spirit days. I thought this idea of a virgin birth was messed up. It was twisted, or it was just untrue. Like, it's just too much to get your head around. It's just too weird. It's too bizarre. It's too supernatural. It's too phenomenal, right? Like, how could you believe in something this crazy, right? But then the Holy Spirit did fill me, <laughs> okay? And I started to understand the things of God, and I started to study the word. And I looked at the scripture, and I'm like, man, I think this is more true than most other things. I looked at it, and I'm like, oh, now I believe it, man. Now I believe. And I'm not sure what happened in the womb of Mary there. Like, I don't know. People have speculated about it. They're like, did somehow some sort of physiological thing happen between heaven and earth that, like, came into her womb? We don't know. People try to explain that stuff. And you can make your mind explode trying to figure that stuff out. But I do believe it was true. And there's a reason why, all right? Bible nerd hat on again. You with me? Put yours on, too. Come on, grab your hat and go. Go. Real quick. Good job. Sound like you need a popsicle, man. Moody Bible Institute, actually. Which, again, like, I don't love Moody for everything they do. But they wrote a great article articulating the scriptural basis for the virgin birth. Can I just read it to you? Check it out, because it summarizes it so well. The virgin birth is implied in the Old Testament. This is all scriptural, okay? As early as Genesis 3.15, like God talks about it, like that the woman, Eve, is going to like stomp on the serpent's head, right? That she's going to have an offspring, right? Which promised that the seed of the woman would be the victor over Satan and sin. And it's expressly predicted in Isaiah 7.14, behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Yeah? Which means God is with us. Yeah? According to Matthew 1, 22-23, this prophecy was fulfilled in Mary. She was called a virgin in Luke 1, 27. Now, the Greek term parthenos nor normally referred to an unmarried woman of a marriageable age. Mary, that's what the term was, virgin, parthenos. Mary did not conceive through ordinary means, but through the Holy Spirit. That's Luke 1.35 testifies to this. The word testifies, and this was God's miraculous intervention. It produced offspring without a human father, that God produced offspring without an earthly father. No man or angel, no Zeus, all right, no law and order SVU criminal God was involved in impregnating Mary. As many people even believe in the Middle East and the world, they believe this about, like, Christians are crazy. They think this happened, right? No, we believe it was miraculous. Christ, who was God from all eternity, took hold of this human nature, thus conceived and joined it to himself. Come on, man. Hebrews 2.14, Philippians 2.7. What called for the virgin birth? Now, listen up, man. This is dope right here, okay? I can say dope even though I'm 42. All right? The fundamental need was found in the nature of the human race, all right? Every normal human birth produces another sinful person. You got it? Just as Adam, a sinner, produced a race of sinners, that's Genesis 5, Romans 5, Ephesians 2, our Savior had to be genuinely human and truly sinless in order to be our perfect substitute and pay our penalty of guilt before the eyes of his infinite Father, God, by his death. Amen? Amen? 1 Peter 1, 18 to 19 and Hebrews 9, 14 testifies to this, that Jesus willingly wanted to give up his life, but first he was truly sinless and tempted in every way, as we are, yet without sin. We're going to get to that, too. Now, this doctrine stands at the heart of the Lord's person and saving work. Without the virgin birth, would there be salvation for sinners like us? Wouldn't Jesus Christ be a sinful human being instead of sinless? Because it had to happen miraculously. Like, I had to get my head around this. Y'all with me? If the virgin birth did not occur, then can it also be said that other aspects of the Bible are not true and cannot be trusted? Like, in short, it's an essential part of Scripture. And if you read the book of Luke, it gives, like, a hardcore account. Mary and Joseph, visited by angels, told this was going to go down. They go through all this suffering and trial in order to, like, live it out. Like, it's really there. And, I mean, you really can believe it. And so I and Streetlight, we believe that Jesus was sinlessly brought into this world straight from heaven into the womb of Mary, okay? Like, we might not always be able to explain it, 
We might not always understand it, but we believe in the testimony of the word that says this. And we believe that God can do anything, even real crazy stuff. He can. And we also believe that Jesus was fully God and fully man without division or confusion of the two natures. All right? I'm going to put my Bible nerd hat on again. Come on, put it on. Ready? Oh, man. It's like really getting bad. My trend with the Bible nerd hat. Okay? Again, this stuff is really good, too. It's fire. Listen up. This is where we get the term hypostatic union from the Greek hypostasis, which means person or subsistence. This idea of being fully God and fully man, fully human, fully God. It's a technical term in Christian theology employed in mainstream Christology. This is straight from Wikipedia, y'all. Somebody say Wikipedia. To describe the union of Christ's humanity and divinity in one hypostasis or individual personhood. Somebody say hypostasis. In the most basic terms, the concept of hypostatic union states that Jesus Christ is both fully God and fully man. He is simultaneously perfectly divine and perfectly human. Come on, who else is? The Athanasian Creed. Come on, man, put your Bible nerd hat on tighter to hear this, okay? Recognize this doctrine. Athanasian Creed affirmed its importance by saying he is God. Jesus is God from the essence of the Father begotten before time, okay? And he is human from the essence of his mother, born in time, completely God, completely human, with a rational soul and human flesh. Come on, man. Equal to the Father as regards divinity, less than the Father while on earth as regards to humanity in a sense because he was limited in some ways, yeah? This is mind-blowing, y'all. Although he is God and human, yet Christ is not two, but one. He is one. However, not by his divinity being turned into flesh, but by God's taking humanity to himself. You got it? He is one, certainly not by the blending of the, his essence, but by the unity of his person. For just as one human is born, is both rational soul and flesh, so too the one Christ is both God and human. Listen. If you don't hear that and go, I don't know what else you can do. It's the stuff of heaven, man, being like dropped down into earth, and we got to wrestle with it, and we can't figure it all out, but we get a little taste of it. Listen, Jesus was God on earth. Do you know that while he was on earth, he fully displayed the holiness and the majesty and the perfection of God? Though people tried to bait him, though people tried to badmouth him, Though people didn't get who he was, he never sinned against anybody. Not once. He didn't do it one time. He rose people from the dead. Okay? You can talk about God on earth. He rose Lazarus from the tomb after he had been dead and stunk. All right? The King James Version said he stunk it. He stank it. (laughs) And rose him out. I mean, he turned water to wine. He healed people who were born blind. He healed people that were born deaf. He healed people that were paralyzed. He did all this miraculous, crazy God stuff. And most of all, he was just sinless. He always said the right thing at the right time. He always did the right thing at the right time. Would you all like a little bit more of that? I sure would. He was also completely human, which means he wept. He had to sleep. When he was a baby, his mom had to change change him. He probably pooped himself. I don't know what kind of diapers they had back then, like papyrus diapers or what. Like, he had to eat. He got stressed out. He got tired. He got exhausted, okay? He experienced human limitations, right? At times he said, only the Father knows the hour. Only the Father knows when all these things are going to happen and when's, what's going to happen. But he knew some divine things and some things limited, right? And I think he farted sometimes. <laughs> and I think when he farted, he laughed. But that's just my speculation. speculation. Amen. Philippians 2 says it all, all right? And I'm going to passionately preach and proclaim this passage until I go to meet Jesus myself. Say it loud with me, will you? Can you read it? Come on, stand up and say it. Stand up with me, will you? Stand up and say it. I know you're all chilling, but this is so good. Let's say this in worship together. This is like instructions Paul wrote to the Philippians. It's for us, too. It's for us right now. Say it with me, Ready? Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, 
did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Give praise to his name for that truth. You can sit, man, but think about it for a second. Jesus is fully God and fully man. He was fully human and fully God at the same time, man. It's mind-blowing that he did that so that he could give his life as a sacrifice for us, willingly do that, go to the cross for us, rise again from the dead, get resurrected, ascend to heaven, and sit at the right hand of the Father, and one day every knee's going to bow to him. What kind of God do we have that would come down to our Lowly state. We're in a lowly place, struggling with our humanity, struggling against our sin. God would send his son Jesus down to live amongst us, to love us, to meet us where we were at, and to perfectly obey God, but also perfectly love us and give his life as a sacrifice for us. That's the best news in the universe. You're not going to find better news than that. It's better than anything. And I think back to beliefs. That kind of stuff unites people. Yeah. Jesus' humanity and Jesus' divinity unites people. It does it all across the globe. I mean, it's the kind of conviction you can have that just it brings people together in love. It's what it does. All right, you ready for the next one? The next article of faith is this. We believe in the Holy Spirit, one of the three persons of the Trinity who convicts the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. He is the life, the life of every believer. Come on. Empowering the believer for godly living, service, and the preaching and teaching of the gospel. And the gifts of the Spirit are for ministry in the body of Christ. Right? Now, I could do a year-long sermon series on the Holy Spirit. All right? The Western church has practically forgotten him. <laughs> all right? Many in white evangelical spaces have forgotten him. Like... We've swept him under the rug. We've also distorted him. We've abused him. <laughs> but I mean, for brevity, I'm just going to hit some points here. I'm not going to go a year-long worse right now. Right? You'd just be sitting here forever, and you'd be like, I'm out. But then more people would come in. Who knows what would happen? But I mean, when we look at this article of faith, it states that the Holy Spirit is a person. That's what it states. He's not a force. He's not impersonal. He's not a feeling, okay? Okay. He's not a ball of mysterious goo, all right? He's not like, let the Holy Spirit be with you, like let the force be with you, or let the farce be with you, right? He's not the spiritual aspect of our soul. He's uniquely who he is. Come on, let me explain further, okay? When Jesus talked about the coming of the Holy Spirit after his resurrection and ascension, he said, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but he, you getting the theme here? I got it in italics, in bold too. He, a person, okay? He will speak whatever he hears. He will also declare to you what is to come. He will glorify me because he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. The Holy Spirit is going to hear from Jesus and come declare it to us. Praise to his name. Everything the Father has is mine, Jesus said. This is why I told you that he takes from what is mine and will declare it to you. That's John 16, 13 to 15. And Jesus is instructing his disciples about the Spirit coming. And they're all freaked out like he's going to die. He's going to leave us. You know, they don't understand what's going to happen. They don't really even understand that. And Jesus is trying to explain that to them. But he's like, hey, guess what? It's going to be even better because I'm going to go sit at the right hand of God. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit down to live in you. <laughs> Notice how Jesus is referring to a person here. He's literally saying... He would die. He would rise again. 
He would ascend to heaven, sit at the right hand of the Father, and then send an actual person equal to him and the Father in essence, yet different in function, to come and live inside of every disciple of Jesus at once. That's what he's saying. You got it? Anybody get excited about the Holy Spirit? Or am I just hollering at you too much? Like, he's a person that lives in all of us at the same time. You get it? So when we worship, like, he's living in us. He's worshiping. <laughs> like, when I'm speaking, he could come and, like, enter me and speak to you, right? And I'm in the way, plenty, and we all are, right? In your conversations that you have, he can come and, like, live in you and speak through you and, like, overcome who you are and overcome your flesh. And he'll, like, come, and the very words of God will come through you. And you don't deserve that, and neither do I. And none of us are perfect vessels, but he comes and lives in us. Yeah? yeah? Now the Holy Spirit came to convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in Jesus. This is Jesus' words from John 16, 8b through 11. About righteousness, because Jesus went to the Father, and his disciples would no longer see him in the flesh. And about judgment, because the ruler of this world had officially been judged through what Christ accomplished. Yeah? The Holy Spirit convicts genuine disciples of Jesus of their sin. That's one of his functions. He comes and dwells in us, and we don't want to admit our stuff. We don't. We want to think we got it all together. All of us want to do that. And then the Holy Spirit comes in and is like, hey, Ben, yo, dude, you need to go apologize for that. Hey, Ben, you need to go do this. Hey, Ben, you need to say this. Hey, Ben, you need to confess this to God, all right, and then be healed of it. And be forgiven. Be reminded you're forgiven. Because you are, right? The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. And thank God he does. Because if we all just kept sinning against each other in the church or ever, anywhere else, it would just be a big old mess. But thankfully, he comes and lives in us and guides us. Isn't that good? And the Holy Spirit leads genuine disciples of Jesus into God's righteousness. Right? Followers of Jesus after his resurrection and ascension are actually, actually in an even more privileged era than when Jesus was on earth. Did you know that? Because of the Spirit. It's true. Because Jesus, and again, I've said over and over, like, I wish I was there. I'd love to just talk to Jesus in the flesh. But because of the Holy Spirit, we have God in the Spirit living in us. Jesus now sits in a glorified state next to the Father right now. And he utters all the truths of heaven into the Holy Spirit, who literally lives in us. Does it make you excited? Or am I just crazy? The Holy Spirit has an eternal confidence that gets infused into us. He knows that Satan is done for. He knows it. He has greater authority than Satan, and he empowers the Christ follower to stand right in Satan's face and make him cower. The Holy Spirit can give you such boldness that you're just like, boom, stop. There's nothing you can do. Because you have no hold on me because of the Spirit. Yeah. Devil can't kill me. No, he can't. I'm telling you. Right. Wait till he drops that one, man. Listen. Listen, listen for it. The Holy Spirit is the life of every believer. He empowers the believer for godly living, for service and the preaching and teaching of the gospel. Yes. The Spirit-filled life like, fills us with the word and fills us with truth and fills us with encouragement and fills us with love. And fills us with kindness and gentleness and faithfulness and joy. Amen. He's the one that does it. We don't get joy on our own. We can pollute ourselves and not let him in. But we don't get that joy on our own. He fills us with it. And we want to stay in a place where we're tapping into that over and over. Because there ain't nothing better, y'all. There ain't nothing better. Not only all that, the gifts of the Spirit are for ministry in the body of Christ. Whew. Now, I could take months to explain this. All right? But passages like 1 Corinthians 14 speak of how the Spirit can move in a gathering of Christ followers. He can move, yeah? yeah? Say, he can move. He can move. Plus, the book of Acts testifies to the miraculous things of the Spirit in the early church. And these things are still happening through disciples of Jesus all around the world, Amen. even in America. The Spirit hasn't shut down. Amen. He ain't done. And if you just want to, like, read on this, man, read the deep dive I put together. And I pulled this excerpt just talking about all the things the Holy Spirit did in the book of Acts. 
And it's after Jesus rose and ascended and lived at the right hand of the Father and sent the Spirit down. And miraculous things kept happening. And guess what? They've been happening for 2,000 years. All right? The Spirit ain't done moving. He sure ain't done moving in Kenmore. He sure ain't done moving in Akron. He sure ain't done moving in the midst of the lives of people that are struggling and hurting and going through a living hell on earth. He's not done, okay? Amen. And he wants to show who God is to people that desperately need God, okay? Amen. I'm not talking about hucksters here, man. Like, there are garbage exploiters of the spirit that just want to make a big buck and live in a mansion, okay, and knock people out on a video, okay? And want to get on camera and want to, like, say everybody can be healed whenever they say so. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit. The one that actually does heal, the, the person of God, the third person of Trinity that lives in believers, and at times we participate in his work, okay? And I firsthand, I've directly experienced the Holy Spirit giving me visions. Like, I have been in visionary states of seeing heavenly things, and I can't explain it, but I know it was the Spirit, okay? And it doesn't happen all the time, and I can't just say, okay, give me a vision now, and he'll do it. He's like, I'm going to listen to you. I'll give you the vision when you need it. He's given me dreams that are like crazy, prophetic stuff, man. Where I've like seen into the heavenly realm at times, seen something that's happening with somebody. I could tell stories, y'all. If you want to hear them, come ask me. I got them. He's healed me physically on at least six separate occasions. The Spirit has. He healed one of my kids physically on one occasion. It was crazy. She just like prayed for it and it just happened. She had the flu. We were about to go on a road trip. And then she prayed, and like the flu just went away. And then we left on a road trip. And I was like, thank you, Jesus, for letting us go on this road trip. Although he doesn't care about that, okay? He drove a demon out of a friend of mine before he gave his life to Christ a month later. He drove a demon out right in the living room and like shut the voices that were happening in his head and made him leave and like made this friend like free and clear of that, right? And he no longer heard those voices like speaking into his mind about suicidal ideation and stuff. Praise God. There's psychological reasons why this stuff happens, too. But, I mean, the Holy Spirit is real. Driving a demon out of my family member on numerous occasions before they came into a relationship with Jesus. That was another thing I saw. And also, the Holy Spirit has filled me in a new way where I began to speak in a heavenly language that I knew only God could understand. And it was the weirdest thing in the world. And it still happens. <laughs> and at the same time, he completely has removed anxiety from me. You ever experienced that before? He's completely removed depression from me. He's, like, filled my soul with joy, like, when I was feeling terrible and empty and awful and, and, like, awful garbage in my being. And I've experienced, like, the power of God come and free me. Have you f experienced that freedom before? Yeah, yeah. But all in all, the greatest ministry of the Holy Spirit is the fact that he keeps us in intimate relationship with Jesus day in and day out. Yeah. That's the greatest thing about him. It's not all that miraculous stuff. All that stuff is icing on the cake, man. The actual cake is the fact that he keeps us in intimacy with Jesus, yeah? yeah? Now, Mission Control at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston is the hub of human space flight, okay? The building is staffed 24-7 with flight controllers who constantly monitor the International Space Station and the humans living on board. That's what they do, all right? So these flight controllers hear vital information from NASA leadership and then they speak that info into the spacesuits and space capsules that hold the astronauts who need to hear it. That's what they do. So there's like Father NASA, all right? There's Mission Control, who sits at the right hand of NASA and speaks what needs to be said into the astronauts, all right? The human beings who have the voice of Father NASA coming in through all this, right? So Father NASA speaks into Mission Control. Mission Control speaks into astronauts. And then they hear the truth they need to hear to be on mission. Yeah? And that's what the Holy Spirit is. It's like we're on this crazy mission for Jesus. Somebody say it's a crazy mission. It's wild. Living for Jesus is a wild, nuts adventure. Don't let anybody tell you different. Because he's going to ask you to do wild stuff and go into the unknown. And it's like we have fear. We have difficulty. We have struggle. We feel like out of our element. And mission control speaks the truth into us. Yeah? Mission control is Jesus sitting at the right hand of God like, I got you. Here's some stuff you need. I'm going to help you through this mission. We're going to get you safely home to me. That's our God. 
That's what he does. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the Father. That's the Son. Yeah? yeah. Come on, give him praise real quick. <laughs> Woo! I just can't preach that without blowing my voice out, I guess. God, we love you. We are thankful for the Godhead. We're thankful for the Trinity. We're thankful for the Holy Spirit. We're thankful that the Spirit lives in us. We're thankful that the Holy Spirit moves in miraculous ways and does miraculous things. And we're also thankful for the times where he moves through doctors and he moves through psychology and all that. We're thankful for everything the Spirit does and all the means by which he uses your people. We're so grateful for his power. And Jesus, we are grateful that you did come to earth and you were fully in fellowship with God, helping to create the universe and the heavens and the earth. And you came down to earth as a human, limited, struggling, tempted, battling. And you were fully God and you were fully human. And you came born of a virgin birth. You came in untainted to this earth just to give us a taste of heaven. And we want a taste of it now. And we want to continue to taste it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Come on, y'all. It's good. Give God some praise, man.